Hi, and welcome to the PD Bytes St. Louis School Library Year in Review mini conference. This is our last session today, and I'm excited to have some special guests for our panel. Um, but first, let me introduce myself. I am Shannon Steinle. I am the Future Ready Librarian for Lift for Life Academy and the Greater St. Louis School Librarian's Library Media Specialist of the Year for this year. So thank you for that recognition. Uh, one of our co-hosts, Victoria Jones, had to duck out a little early because she has uh, car to Royals tickets. So I will. Oh, nice. <laughs> go cards. <laughs> so we'll let uh, our other guest host introduce herself and tell uh, how her role relates to the library. Sure. My name is Alicia Landers. I'm the director of curriculum technology for the Melville School District, and one of the uh, one of my major responsibilities is to oversee the district library program. Great. So uh, let me start here. Uh, we're going to go around and introduce ourselves and share a highlight from the school year. So I'm just kind of going to go in the order that I see you guys on my screen. So Matt is up first. Hi, um, my name is Matt King. I am a school librarian at Discovery Elementary School in the Orchard Farm School District. Um, the, I think probably for me personally was being selected as an ALA Emerging Leader for the 2019 year. <laughs> I am the treasurer. Uh, I was just elected in at the last meeting. Terrific. Okay, Mindy's up next. Hi, I'm Mindy Botkin. Um, I'm the high school librarian at Orchard Farm High School and the content leader for our district. Um, I serve as the vice president for Greater St. Louis Librarians. And a uh, highlight for me from this year was presenting with Janita, Gina Donato, sorry about that, um, with Follett at METC. Terrific. And uh, Julie, go ahead. Okay, I'm Julie Jamison. I'm an elementary librarian in Fort Zumwalt, Flint Hill Elementary. I'm also the K-12 library curriculum coordinator in my district. Um, at, for our organization, I serve as membership secretary, which I enjoy a lot. Also, this coming school year, I'm going to be the um, Mazel Spring Conference co-chair, so I'm super excited about that. Um, a highlight I have for the school year is I've just gotten a lot better with the elementary kids with integrating STEAM and in with literature. I've really been working on that. That was a goal and it went pretty well this year. That sounds great, Julie. Uh, so before we get started with our first question, I thought I would just share a highlight from my year besides being named LMS of the year. <laughs> um, we started a partnership with uh, ITEF, the Innovative Technology Education Fund, where they provided us with Chromebooks and hotspots for checkout from the library overnight, um, which is really great um, because I work at a high poverty school. And we were able to close the achievement gap this year for our students as far as the homework gap goes by over 5,000 hours. So pretty exciting Very nice. for us. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. It is. It's awesome. Yeah, over half of our students uh, participated, so it was wonderful. Wow. Great. Okay, so Alicia's going to ask the next question. Yeah, so, you know, we work really hard. I think all librarians work really hard, and it's our desire to have a vibrant, collaborative culture um, in your building and district. Um, it, with the Melville School District, we have been working hard at this as well. In fact, we started a partnership three years ago with Fox School District, and we created what we call the Instructional Innovation Incubator. And this school year, um, J.P. Presavento, he's the Fox um, I think he's the director of instructional technology for Fox. Uh, we decided to focus on libraries. So we also brought in one of my lead librarians, Aaron Nichols, and we created this, um, I guess our whole project focuses on how to build collaborative relationships in our district. Um, and what we did is we, invited our librarians to come in and we had 
over 50% of Melville and Fox librarians working together, and it was a beautiful collaboration. It was like they were immediately um, bonded. It was like everyone talked the same language and, and we had a great time. But what we uh, looked at in our first couple sessions is how has libraries and how has the librarianship right librarianship I can't talk sorry guys <laughs> how how is it evolving and what changes need to take place um, we also looked at the AASL standard of collaboration and we realized that we needed to really define some terms because we were all talking about collaborating and everyone's working hard to collaborate. But when it came down to it, some of the things we were calling as collaborating really was cooperating. We were cooperating with other teachers and providing resources. And mm -hmm. we were also coordinating with teachers where that took a little more, it was more formal where we had the same goal, but that might be teaching um, in the library on plagiarism or copyright, but our goal really is collaborating where it's an equal partnership, there's ongoing communication, high engagement, and um, student focused and we really wanted to make an impact on that learning. So once we had kind of like the definitions down and we knew what we were striving for, we were then able to talk about um, how to co-teach with the teachers in, in our buildings. So we looked at four major, um, or four relevant co-teaching models, and that's team teaching, parallel teaching, station teaching, and then differentiation. And so we really dove into them, and then something really um, magical started happening. The teachers or the librarians were then able to understand like, oh my gosh, I could do so many different things because their idea of what co-teaching was just blossomed. And they were able to reach out to other teachers in their building. And so then the second half of the incubator, they invited in a co-teacher and Together, that librarian then taught the teacher, their guest teacher, the different ways that they can co-teach together. And they started lesson planning. And they, they chose a model that worked best for their situation. And they implemented that lesson. In our very last session, which we just had a couple weeks ago, both the co-teacher and the librarian, um, they presented on their experience and the reflection and, and what their next steps are. So it really was something that was a lot of fun. It was great to see other another district that is similar in size to us and um, you know we're next door neighbors so now we feel like our our walls are open even larger um, because we have this partnership with Fox and we've decided that we're moving forward next year that the incubator will be um, library focused again so that we can take it to the next level but what I'd really like to hear from you guys is what are you doing in your buildings or your districts to really bring in this collaborative culture? That's something that I can say uh, and at least at the building level in our elementaries that is very challenging because we have are on the fixed schedule and part of the specials rotation um, and that's something I'm continually looking myself to add more and figure out ways I can bring the teachers in with this co-teaching model because I just have to say I don't know if other districts are like this but my district is so heavy on the curriculum and they don't feel like they have time every I mm -hmm. figure out a way to tell the teachers it's not one more thing you know that they have to add to their plate and I haven't quite gotten there yet it's really hard with the uh, rigid schedule as opposed to the flex schedule at the elementary level you know, I, I will admit at the incubator for our elementary librarians, because mm -hmm. they are fixed schedule, that was something they had to work really 
um, hard with their co-teacher and some of them decided to go to the station teaching model where some stations were being taught in the classroom and other stations um, were being taught in the library, but mm -hmm. they worked together to come up with a rubric and oh, figure right. out how they were going to assess it. So yeah, you're right. Sometimes that time and the availability doesn't, isn't easily um, able to, you know, fix. So they, they figured station teaching worked best for them. That sounds really interesting. I'd actually like to hear more about that. Because um, I just find that to be such a challenge at the elementary level. Mm -hmm. I believe our middle school and high school librarians uh, really work well with the teachers and do a lot of collaborating from what I understand, but I don't know if it's quite as involved as what you just described. I know that, like you said, they, they teach lessons on plagiarism or mm -hmm. and they come into the library or the librarian goes into the um, classroom. Uh, but I don't know how much of it is actual lesson planning together. I think that's something we're all kind of moving toward or wanting to do, but it can be a challenge sometimes, I think. Yeah, and we are, we figured one year we are at the infancy stage. That's why we need to build um, a year two in order to mm -hmm. continue moving forward. So I was impressed that you took the time to define collaboration. Um, simply because a lot of people define collaboration so differently mm -hmm. and by being able to, and I think because I'm working, that's my thesis, that's my focus of my thesis is collaboration. I think a lot of times people think cooperation and coordination is, is collaboration. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is a lower end of collaboration, right? According to Montel overall in her um, teacher collaboration model, it is a lower end, but to get to that higher end of that co-teaching, I think that's so important. And I think that's amazing that you're able to do that. And maybe I would also like to talk to you uh, <laughs> Well, maybe you guys want to join our incubator next year. That would be amazing. That would be. That would be fabulous because I would agree that it's very difficult to get teachers to give up the time. Um, like Julie said, they're so focused on um, curriculum that I often do feel that more what I do at the high school level is coordination and cooperation, but not necessarily mm -hmm. co-teaching. Um, the success that I've had is when I go to teachers with a specific lesson plan idea that I have, something that I saw on Twitter or a blog that I'm reading, and, and then I go to them and I say, you know, this really matches what you're doing, so let's try to work on this. So that's been somewhat successful. So I think that uh, you and JP need to present about this at Mazel. <laughs> <laughs> we have talked about that. <laughs> And we're contemplating METC as well. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, Definitely. let me uh, advance my slide here. So um, we are going to just start throwing out some questions from uh, the people that registered for this mini conference. And you can answer it if you have an answer or if you uh, don't have an answer, that's okay too. Uh, so we'll just kind of take volunteers and I'm going to go ahead and read the first question. So Liz from Hancock would like to know any advice or tips as we fully embrace future ready in our districts. I know we have some future ready folks here, so <laughs> feel free to jump in. Um, the Orchard Farm School District is a designated future ready district, which has been so exciting for us. And um, Matt and I are in the same district, so he can also answer as to a lot of the changes that we've seen in our libraries over the last couple years. And one of the things that I would highly recommend is try not to address all the gears at once. Pick one or two that really resonate with you um, and then just focus on those. Um, we're super excited that um, October 18th, the Orchard Farm School District is hosting a Future Ready Conference. It's free to all administrators, tech coaches, instructional coaches, librarians. So if you're really looking to dive into Future Ready, it would be a great introduction to do so. Is there a registration for that, Mindy? Yes, I will be posting that very soon on Twitter. So if everyone can share it out um, as soon as I post that. We just received that from the Alliance for Excellent Education the other day. Awesome. 
All right, our next question comes from Jillian Lutz from DeSoto. She asks, how do you balance promoting a love for reading and technology instruction? Oh, I'll jump in on that one. This is my, this is one of my topics that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I, this, a couple years ago, Carolyn Allen and I, a librarian from uh, Hazelwood, we decided that we were going to um, use the Show Me nominees as, a as our starting off point um, and then create activities centered around them. And we decided to package them in HyperDocs. And that has been so successful. So mm -hmm. the HyperDoc, uh, if you're familiar with hi what HyperDocs are, it's basically like a digital package with learning activities um, in there. It's not just clicking on links, though. They really are centered around the four C's, the creativity, communication, critical thinking, and collaboration. Uh, like an example is with the Show Me nominee, uh, the magic word this last time, they, uh, I had them read an article and, and respond to an article about um, how to be polite to others on digital, on social media, and they did that. They I incorporated a makerspace activity, uh, just different things in it, and they're using technology, but still celebrating that really good book. So uh, that's something I presented on, we presented on at Mazel, and we're actually gonna be presenting on that at the AASL conference in um, Kentucky coming up soon. Yeah. So excited about that. Congratulations on getting to present that. I missed the Mazel presentation, but luckily the slides were shared out. And so I just am so impressed with your HyperDoc lessons. They're amazing. Um, thank you. I really like them. The only problem is I just don't have time. The kids never have time to get through everything, but I just, I'm starting to learn to let go a little bit and just <laughs> for one or two things. That's good. <laughs> But my, um, we do have a library curriculum at Fort Zumwalt, and we have four strands in it. Uh, love of reading is one, technology, digital citizenship, and information literacy. So in the HyperDocs, I try to embed something that addresses all of those things. Anybody else want to jump in with an answer on this one? Or should we, we move on? I'm good. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> All right, this is from Melissa Ray from Northwest. She wants to know, how do you change your administrator's mindset? So oh, something I did was I had, I started a student advisory board. The student advisory board was nice because um, they were the ones to help make decisions for the library and having a student advisory board come to your principal with ideas or requests for funds is more impactful than for me going in and asking um, for that as well. Also, building, making sure that you uh, promote your library as much as possible, especially to the outside community, um, because I think that really helps to using your Twitter account or even contacting, like, I contacted a bank close to our school and they donated, and um, Dollars American Revolution donated. So it's just being able to, um, and once you start programs that your principal sees are impactful, I think that they're more willing to also um, um, help support the library more. And I agree with Matt. I think the more that you invite your administrators to see what you're doing, um, I also sit down with my building principals and um, we usually do it quarterly and talk about what's going on in the library. And I think that's really shifted their perspective on how the library really has become the hub of the high school and, and what the library can offer. So I would invite your administrators as much as you can and, and try to sit down with them occasionally because you are very busy. I try to keep it very focused and um, you know, succinct, very brief, but um, really letting them know what you're doing and how you're contributing can really change. Um, and then they seem to be a little bit more supportive when you start asking for things. One of the pieces of advice that uh, Bill Bass shared that I think is really helpful is to think about like what are the goals of the school and what are the priorities for the administrators and then how can you as the library and, and the library support those goals and priorities um, because if you can show that connection then I think you make your importance um, and the, the program's importance even more. 
Okay, so um, our next, oh, sorry, no, go, go ahead, Alicia. I was going to say, we always try to speak the language of the administrator. There's some administrators that really like Twitter. Tweet out what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. Highlight the principal when you can. Um, we have one administrator that loves flow charts. So she puts together um, a document that is flow chart like because it that administrator responds and and gets it. So we try to speak the boss's language whenever we can. <laughs> Um, Jennifer Baker from Fox asks, do you have any exciting ideas for makerspace for high school students? And has anyone tried a passion project, either a small one or a year long one? And tell me about if it was successful or not. Our, uh, one of our high school social studies teachers um, does a passion project and um, he changed the title to a capstone project, but essentially it is the students selecting something that they're really passionate about. Um, it's a semester long project and he does it in all of his social studies classes and it's been extremely impactful. Um, many kids have really kind of found what makes them unique mm -hmm. and what it is that they have to offer. We have some students that they've actually started their own business off of their passion project. Um, we have a couple students that are making um, like bandanas for dogs and selling them online and at craft fairs and things like that. So mm -hmm. it's been really exciting um, to see kids um, share their passion and, and develop it and take it to a whole nother level. So um, unfortunately, he's moving to Florida. So we're really hoping mm -hmm. that another teacher is going to take that over um, because it, it really has been impactful for our entire building. And a lot of kids really look forward to that project. And he just dedicates time um, every class period that they, they get to do some research or um, contact members of the community and really try to develop that project. Um, but for high school, as far as makerspace, um, it, it is really hard to get high school students into the library for makerspace because they are in sports and clubs and they're so active. A lot of them have jobs right after school. Um, so one of the things that we've done at the high school that's super um, successful, um, we call the Makerspace Field Trips, mm -hmm. and we bring in experts from the community, and they actually um, sign a permission slip and get out of class to come and spend time with that expert. Um, we've done a film festival. We've done a video game competition where they designed video games and, and things like that. So that's been um, really helpful to get more students into the library for Makerspace. So, Julie, I know you're in charge of all the librarians. Do you have some advice for high school librarians with Makerspace? Um, I know our high school librarians are trying to figure out how they can get that, how they can get it in. They're working on it. Um, I don't know if that's been the biggest push with our high school librarians yet. I know the middle school librarians have definitely jumped on board. Um, uh, one of our middle schools has like a makerspace room and uh, the kids come, can come in before school or during, um, during lunch maybe. Also, I know that one of the other middle school librarians uh, does have uh, science classes coming in and they do it with the classroom for like an exploration time. But I do think at the secondary level, it is a challenge to figure out how to get those kids in for making um, but it, it does sound like it's been successful at the middle school level, at least, to collaborate with a science teacher on it or, and do some kind of a joint come in and have some exploration time. I know that's worked. Okay. All right. Natalie Olshek from Melville asks, how, what, what's your strategy for helping teachers and students to understand that you're a teacher, that librarians are also teachers? I did a um, collaborate. I worked with um, third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers um, in working with a lesson that um, dealt with a lot of research for like Missouri history. And so we worked together um, to provide the standards that I'm teaching in the library and combine the standards that they were required to teach in their classroom, combine them, we create a scoring guide for that. And it helped them understand that um, 
that I was part of that whole teaching process, right? That, um, and the teachers also, um, it was nice because then the teachers also saw me as a co-teacher as well, instead of just, just, just a librarian uh, mm -hmm. and doing my own thing. So I think the more that you're able to, to provide those co-teaching experiences where, the, where they can actually see the classroom teacher, I think that is very beneficial. Um, and I think that will, will, helps out in that area. Okay. Any other ideas? Hmm. I feel like our teachers understand that the librarians are teachers too, at least in my building. I mean, um, but I also think just, you know, I try to put out information to show how I can support them as teachers and how I can bring in extra resources. And I think they really are, you know, digital resources. And I think that helps them understand that, oh, this isn't somebody who's just scanning and checking out books or reading books. So whenever I can kind of tie things in with the curriculum and what we're doing and what their with their curriculum, I think that really helps when I can promote the library that way. All right, thank you. So Laura Laramore, an elementary librarian at Bayless. She asked, for the first time ever, we have two librarians at the elementary school. How do we determine the best way to meet everyone's needs? Also, the makerspace and technology programs are coming back under the librarian umbrella. Which aspects of each of these programs is most important to our students' educations? I think that's fabulous that they have two librarians. I'm super jealous. Um, like I, in one elementary building, there's two, I wonder. Yeah, uh, that's it's going to be two. But I think it's because the technology elective is coming under the umbrella of the library. And so it's going to be com like combined. Mm. Well, I'm actually, te I actually am the technology teacher too in my building because my building is so small. So, um, I teach technology to the third, fourth, and fifth grade and give them grades and everything, plus I'm the librarian. So um, as far as what's most important, I, I guess I, I don't understand fully what their, uh, there are two librarians there and they have technology and makerspace added back under their program is what it sounds like. Right. Like you said. And it sounds like they're trying to figure out what aspects of the programs are most in, most important to the student for their education. So I'm curious if they've done any surveys. Have they surveyed their teaching staff and the students to find out what it is that that they are interested in? That might be where I would start. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would think with. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Shannon. Oh, I was just going to say in Matt's session, he was talking about how having a student advisory committee really mm -hmm. informed the changes he wanted to make in the library. So um, maybe after you're done, Julie, Matt could speak to that again for anyone that missed that session. Um, the one thing I was going to suggest is I think computer science is really important today and coding. Um, I think that that is something really critical for kids to learn to be problem solvers. And I think that can intertwine um, technology. I think if I was doing both technology and the makerspace uh, a lot with the robots, there's coding like Dash Robot, Ozobot, and then also code.org is a free program to use. And I think that's a great way to integrate the technology in with so many of the other things that we care about in our libraries too, all of those. Um, future ready and AASL standards that we kind of hold ourselves accountable to. Coding is something that really fits in with many of those. So that would be a suggestion for where to start. Okay. Uh, the student activity board, I'm uh, sorry, student advisory board that was mentioned is, I thought I was meeting the needs of students. I thought I was doing a great job. And then students came and talked to me and said, no, you're really not meeting um, what we need in the library. And so I created a student advisory board where um, a group of students um, met after school once a month um, for an hour, and they um, changed everything about the library. What I thought was good was, was not working well enough, and so it's nice because it gave them a voice. It also allowed them to have ownership of the library, um, and they call it my library now, not 
not in Mr. King's library or the school mm -hmm. library. It's my library. So they really took ownership of that and they changed it at everything around. And it's so much better because you're having all of the students' voices heard and they, they take ownership and they um, have done incredible things that I didn't think I could do. So it's amazing what they've done. Well, I would highly recommend student advisory boards. So Alicia, we're almost out of our time with the free Zoom that I have. So we have time for one more question. So I guess pick out uh, the one you most want to ask. Oh gosh. Um, or the next one on the list is fine too. Yeah. <laughs> so this is from Julie Boatner from Parkway. She wants to launch a, launch a school podcast allowing elementary kids to share on topics they are passionate about. Any advice for convincing my brand new principal to allow it and tips for getting started? I think it sounds great. I haven't podcasted with kids before, but I just shared an article on Twitter about how like listening to podcasts is really great for kids. <laughs> mm -hmm. I haven't tried podcasting either. I'm very curious about that and would like to try that with students. But I, unfortunately, I don't have an answer on that one. Mindy, have you done I, I was going to say, I, I don't have any experience at the elementary level, but at the high school, um, we have started changing the way we do research papers. So instead of them doing a research paper every year, they have options of creating what we consider maybe more authentic products because a research paper is not really something that you, know, you put out to the public, but creating a website or doing a podcast um, creating a blog, um, doing TED Talks. So those are some of the options that we've been giving kids at the high school. Um, and that was really how we sold our principal on um, getting the equipment that we needed. And now, because we've had some success with it, um, they're actually talking about building some audio recording rooms now for us for the podcasting. So um, I haven't been directly involved in that process, but um, it's, it's been really successful and I would highly recommend it. The kids love making podcasts. And Terrific. From what, oh, I ahead, there, from what I understand, there are so many good tools out there for podcasting too. Um, I know we video, my students use we video to create videos, but they also now have an audio yep. option only, which I think would be a good easy tool for elementary kids to get some experience with it. So maybe I'll try that next year. <laughs> Well, guys, we're going to be cut off here in a few minutes, so I'm going to end it there. I just want to thank everyone for their time this afternoon, staying late at the end of the year. I really appreciate that, and I hope everyone has a wonderful summer. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Take care.